Hi, everyone. Welcome to Type Talks. Today, we're here with Dario Nardi, and we're here to discuss the ESFJ subtypes, starting with the dominant subtype. And so Dario Nardi calls this the societal advocate. And this ESFJ has a lot of wiring at the front of their brain. And the subtype is correlated with the hormone testosterone. I'll let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, having me on again. And we talked about ESTJ last time. So ESFJ is like a good adjacent type. And um, e even though they have a, a dominant function that's different between them, you know, feeling versus thinking, there's still like a, a lot that they have in common, especially when their subtype comes into play. And we think about that. So yeah, this uh, dominant ESFJ um, is more driven, more confident uh, than other ESFJs, uh, is not going to be as abrasive and whatnot as an ESTJ who's dominant might be, um, nor necessarily as quick a decision maker or something like that, but is relative to other ESFJs. Um, so what's typical of this pattern is this bias towards the front of the brain, uh, the executive regions, sort of called frontal uh, cortex. It's, it's these um, are called managerial regions of the brain. And also a lot of good auditory connections this is very typical of, of uh, FJs in general, especially ENFJ and, and ESFJ. Um, so yeah, so they're they're relatively quick at decision making, they're speaking with confidence, um, you know, sitting and having a, like a conversation with somebody in dialogue, um, taking in new information, and being able to sort of act as a manager and. I think particularly in this managerial mode is is like we talked about with ESTJ, this ability to to balance their values against the demands of the moment. So in this sense, probably even more than ESTJ, because ESTJ has this introverted feeling that's sort of simple and black and white and anchors them. And, and ESFJ is, tends to be a lot more flexible in this area. So they they can make what look like pragmatic decisions in the moment. Um, is they're trying to balance, well, you know, I have these values, but it's sort of like a hierarchy of values and can be shuffled a little bit. And there's a bit about alliances and, and who's in my network of people and, and then what, or like circle of people and who's a little bit closer to the inside and to the outside. And then this is what the situation is demanding. And it's a very much like um, political way of thinking. And, and so th that's one of the professions that they gravitate toward. Um, and, and they may not view it that way is, oh, I'm going to go in politics because I'm good at, although they may recognize that, uh, this like political way of thinking, usually they go in because they're, they really do want to, as the societal advocate, they see how can we help people in this humanitarian way? And, um, how can we improve people's health, their well being, their quality of living, and um, that, that sense, they, they, they can be in a company for sure, uh, like, uh, you know, moving into a position. If they're younger, of course, they might just be in a starting off role. But as they get older, like wanting to be in this leadership position. So they could be man administrative or managerial. Um, but I think a lot of times they like this community element. Like they actually want to be in contact with and knowing who are our clients, who are our customers, who are our voters. Um, how can I be an advocate for them? How can I be a coach for them? Uh, if it's a little bit more, not that they're going to do one-on-one -on -one coaching because that's not what they'll usually do in this way, but, um, being able to coach the group and, and like ESTJ, especially the dominant version, they are quite aware of what you should be doing or what is to be more accurate, what is best for you? You know, if only we had these values in place in society, you would be happier. I know you would. It might be true, might not be, by the way. Um, they could also be in something a little bit more pragmatic like marketing. So what are ways to speak to people and then be a marketing director, something like that. They, they, they do have some right brain skills, uh, more so than their ESTJ counterpart. So being more aware of like, what, what is the energy of the group? The, why do these people have these attitudes and emotions of feelings about these other people? Being aware of like touch and movement, good language-based skills, 
speaking, listening, metaphor, jokes. Um, I almost hate to say this, but we have a living example that most of us are aware of, listeners in the United States and see every day, is probably Joe Biden is a dominant ESFJ. It's my opinion. I don't know that. Um, and no one can know that. Um, but that's the feeling I get. Um, so that extroverted intuiting can really come through. In terms of how is it described, um, you know, like uh, telling a story in order to better connect with the audience, which might not be a true story, but it's it's better connecting with the audience. So as with all of them, there's like some developmental levels and there's some, some of course, like age and, and circumstance related things. Um, and they do have like some fairly good, if you look in their background, some technical skills that they have as well. Um, it could be in medicine or music or, you know, something usually it's adjacent so that it has like some obvious benefit or interaction with people. Like being an opera singer is like dramatic and fun and you never think, okay, is that going to go into politics or be a dominant personality? But the person could be, you know, so that's like... Uh, the the diva kind of uh, person on stage and and who is that so I, I and of course it, as with all types even with extroverts there is like at time a reflective side and I think the more the person is able to engage that reflective side effectively to like self evaluate collating contemplating recalling you know experiences and putting those together then the richer the more three dimensional the person will be. Absolutely. And so it seems like with the dominant ESFJ, there is still that like that shepherd FE, but mm -hmm. it's done in a very tactful way. When I think of people like Joe Biden, there are some ESFJs that can have quite a, what do you call it? Like a stoic presence? Not that's the wrong word, but it, mm -hmm. like Joe Biden, like sometimes people, yeah, grandfatherly presence. Like some people see extroverted feeling as this like super bubbly or warm yeah. function when sometimes it, it has a grandfatherly or motherly component to it rather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially in this mode and because extroverted feeling and SJs in general are so aware of social roles that it, it is really important to them to know and and to like align with what is, what is my persona? Like, what, what is my social role? And they expect to be treated back in a certain way in return. So if they're saying like, let, let's say they're like a director of a charity organization and they're like the grandmother of the organization, they expect they will do their best to act that way. They will carry themselves that way. And, and they will also be also expect to be treated in return uh, that mm -hmm. way. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so that brings us to the creative ESFJ. Dario calls this the flowing compatriot. This ESFJ has a starburst pattern in their brain, and this subtype is correlated with the hormone dopamine. And this kind of ESFJ is more social and exploratory than other ESFJs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the flowing compatriot, I, I'm not sure that's like really the best name. I'm just sort of in this particular case, like searching for what... Um, what brings together the different elements of it. And, and I think what captures them here, is that flowing part, one is the, the sort of charm or grace that's going to be cultivated as part of a, a performer in a way. Um, and then also their adaptability, which is more, even if the person is SJ type or, or judging just preferences in general, um, there is more openness and more, adaptability than in the other subtypes. And so this person has this like a charming quality to them um, and, and their diversity and skills and interests and, and that kind of thing. And then the compatriot part is, is you know, they're, they're, I mean, it's sort of like as a dance partner or um, a person that's like, you know, also in the band that's a performer, um, maybe a little bit more towards the front of the band. They're not just a support person. But they do have the sense that, like, oh, we're on an adventure, and um, may maybe a way to think of it. Oh, this is I had never really thought about in the Wizard of Oz Dorothy's type, but but the flowing compatriot I feel captures her pretty well. Um, that that at least that that 
that aesthetic quality and that emotional quality. And, oh, who are you? And oh, you're you're a lion or whatever. It's like you're a straw man, but like how where is your brain in the straw when he says he wants a brain? And um, but still like very like asking questions and open and looking for the best of things and skipping along the yellow brick road. Um, and, and it's not completely naive either. Um, you know, there, there's an awareness that there's a witch somewhere and to sort of fear that and, and maybe to do something with it and that you get it done with all, with your friends. And, and so more than being the, with the first one, the metaphor for dominant is like a, like an administrator, a politician, um, that, that this one is much more like the band leader or like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I, I think that that, and, and there is that, by the way, with the Wizard of Oz, there is that very extroverted intuiting component to it. It's a fanciful land and there's sort of an absurdity to it. And, and it's amusing and there are jokes, um, you know, here and there and everywhere in it. And, and it really is like a very nice, um, it's something very entertaining while being like sweet and family oriented uh, and wholesome at the same time. And, and I think that that captures a bit of the, the, this creative ESFJ. Um, in terms of what they do in their backgrounds, I saw a lot of variety there, but it definitely moved towards the direction. I mean, well, I'll just say like counselor, people working in counseling, entertainment, fashion, um, hosting, like event hosting, not necessarily organizing and putting on the events, but being the host of the events. Um, media, music, um, retail. So interacting with people all day and being able to dress the retail windows and that kind of thing. Theater, travel. Um, I think somebody was involved in weddings. So that's also part of like that event and the, you know, entertainment and music and fashion, all of these things all come together in, in a very specific way in weddings. Small business ventures. I, I think that there, this is, the, the facet of the type where, where it's interested in entrepreneurism is going to be here when in this sort of creative starburst that they have. And, and there can be this, um, how can I say, like a little bit of like loosey-goosey carelessness, not a tremendous, not careless in, in the way of being like uh, harming others necessarily, although that can happen, that is more by accident. And, you know, like not taking care of the details, like, oops, I should have taken care of that. But they were busy talking with their friends or helping an elderly parent or whatever it was. And then one of the features of ESFJ, which probably shows up the most with this subtype is, so if extroverted intuiting brings surprises, and extroverted feeling can bring drama, then the two of them together is surprise drama. And, and even for the ENFPs listening out there, if you think you are capable of consciously creating a situation of live drama, uh, of, you know, like surprise drama, um, just for the entertainment value of it and to see how people will react and whatever, um, and, and it is more conscious from the ENFP, like they're bored or they want to do an experiment on somebody or whatever it is. And, and this, and, and I mention it because e this creative subtype of ESFJ and ENFP can be confused with each other. Um, that this surprise drama usually involves some like not lasting damage, but real world, like more concrete kinds of things like, oops, I crashed the car. Um, no one was injured. And it wasn't even a significant crash, but these kinds of things keep regularly happening. And it can come off looking irresponsible to other types and maybe even other subtypes. Uh, and they're not trying to be irresponsible or something. It's just that this creative brainstorm pattern is like everything everywhere all at once. And to have that coexist with those natural SJ preferences is a little bit of a challenge. Um, especially when the dominant function feeling does not have the compartmentalizing power that say an ESTJ is going to have. The ESTJ can be like fun loving, but also keep everything in their box. And ESFJ can be fun loving and like, oops, all of these things are spilling over into different boxes. And I didn't even know there were different boxes. 
because everything is connected. Um, so very, very like, uh, and how you know this different from ENFP, I, I do think that that's one of the things, even though it's like a subtle difference. Um, and then it, it, they, they are dominant judging types rather than dominant perceiving types. And ultimately that extroverted feeling is very important. Um, it generally comes across in a very hosting kind of manner. So it's more soft, um, but it's still there. And then they really have this solid body awareness uh, in terms of like performance, for example, let's say they're a singer and they also do dancing and, and they're like doing the whole routine on stage and they have costumes and this and that. And, and, you know, that could be any type. And at the same time, they're also very tuned into all of the details of all of that. Um, and, and having like an image because they have a role that they're playing and, and being aware of that. It's a type certainly that one doesn't forget when you meet them. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a very eventful time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And so how would the ESFJ differ in how their subtypes show up apart from an ENFJ? So like, let's say there's the dramaticism of the creative ESFJ, but also the dramaticism of the creative ENFJ. Well, mm. What would be different from their forms of drama in that way? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure I'm personally versed enough to draw upon some examples. Um, I, I would say, though, generally, what I have seen is the ENFJ like gets a lot more stern and focused, and their introverted thinking is going to be more like, I have the answer uh, to your growth and let me share it with you. Um, and you're going to sit and listen while I share it with you. Whereas ESFJ, you know, it's like they, they can pretend to be stern on the surface. And that is just an act that they're playing because they are softies underneath. And... Um, and you sort of push them a little bit and they're going to be like, oh, OK, um, let's give it one more, you know, give, let's give it like one more try to see how it goes. Um, and then their introverted thinking is generally going to be more something that is um, either like practical problem solving stuff or like little nuggets of principles that are about running your life successfully with respect to the culture that you live in. ENFJ is not particularly, I mean, they're very, ENFJ is very aware of like the cultural norms, but at the same time, their focus as an NF is going to be on your personal growth and success as a person. And the ESFJ is going to be more focused on, they're still going to see like, what are the social norms? And, and they may or may not appreciate your individuality but they really are going to be a lot more focused on what does it take to succeed and and just to be nice in general. For ENFJ, nice is something you do in order to get things done, like to push through your vision. And for ESFJ, something nice is something you do as an end in and of itself. And and that's and the same applies by the way, every type that knows how to be nice also knows how to be mean, just to clarify that. Um, ESFJ can be mean for no other reason than one of the social emotions like jealousy or envy or something like that. And it just as an end, whereas ENFJ, if they're going to be mean about something, it's, it's going to serve a purpose, like in a, in a big abstract picture, um, is like to show you a lesson or something like that. That's sort of how I see it. It's a little bit differentiating the two temperaments, the NF versus SJ. Yeah, whereas like the NF, the ENFJ is going to going to want to connect it to this larger purpose. Like, let's say I'm going to be kind because it leaves a legacy. It leaves my fingerprint on the world. But it also like they might link it to a spiritual purpose that they develop themselves of how they are going to live. So, yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yes. Um, I, I, yeah. And, and the other thing is that the um, the neurotic zone for each one of them is very different. You know, so so the ENFJ has extroverted sensing as their sort of tertiary strength and challenge area. And then for here, it's extroverted intuiting uh, for ESFJ. And there, there's like some there, some subtleties between that. But as you get to know those two functions and sort of ask, like, 
where where is their to, to follow like the personality hacker car model like where is their 10 year old and and you know it, it's quite different for each one of them mm, makes sense makes sense and so that brings us to the normalizing version of esfj dario calls this the caring specialist and this esfj has more of an even field brain wiring and the hormone associated with this subtype is serotonin. And so this ESFJ is more specialized than most. So they're going to be the most SI, SJ oriented ESFJ. Yeah, yeah. If the, the dominant one looks like, they're not going to look like a thinking type, but the dominant one, the dominant ESFJ might look like an ENFJ, for example, uh, or, or something similar, but still a judging type. And then the creative subtype is going to look like an ENFP or ESFP, by the way. This is uh, the very easy to look like an ESFP as well uh, on the surface. Then the normalizing is going to really, I think, stick with the classic ESFJ stereotypes and even look a little ISFJ-like at times. And then that's about it. Like they're not going to be mistaken for something else. And I think for people who learn type, especially at the beginning, the normalizing is what they think that this type is before that they learn that there are some variations on it. Um, you know, ESFJs can be rabble rousers and troublemakers. If they're the creative subtype, they can actually be quite strong leaders in their style. Uh, whereas is this one here, you know, it, it really is like the one that is the, the, the SJ that works in the large organizations, the ESFJ, who's the hospital nurse, um, academic counselor, customer relations specialist, like executive secretary, even something like dental hygienist. You, you, you know, I mean, it's funny because you get to talk and they don't really get to talk back uh, the client, but um, they they will they they will have. Often, here I am in this workplace, like this is my role, this is how I'm contributing. They're not, they're maybe a little bit ambitious, but they're not really that ambitious. Um, in fact, they're probably strongly influenced by the attitudes of the people around them and where they quote belong and the feedback that they get from their peers. They're the kind that's like careful and concerned and friendly, you know, assuming that they have the opportunity to learn that they can become fairly professional in the way that they feel roles and they really do gravitate towards filling roles in familiar ways. Um, and, you know, the, the extroverted intuiting is going to come up with like a sense of humor more than anything else as a way to get them through the difficulties of their day job, like just soften everything up for everybody. So it's a little bit more fun as we go through otherwise the difficulties of, of our day. Um, I think that they can be uh, like all ESFJs, yes, mindful listeners and speakers, and, and they are particularly attuned to people's feedback more so than say the dominant or creative, because the creative is like bouncing around a lot and may even have an attitude that I, I'm not listening to you because I don't respect you. Um, the dominant is more about talking than listening. Um, and, and this one here is, is sensitive to other people's opinions of them and what is the right thing to do and feeling like, oh, I'm not doing enough. And, uh, you know, they get to the end of their day and there's still more room. There's more things on the to-do list. And then feeling like, oh, I should stay up in order to like finish these extra things to make it just perfect in its presentation or to help my kids with their homework or to sit with my spouse, you know, and talk about the problem that is, is there today from work or whatever it is. Um, and, and the, the thinking is not sophisticated. It's very much like we're going from A to Z and we're going to stop each point along the way and we're going to do this and then we do it like this and then we follow this step. And so that can make them certainly slower. This person is normalizing or dominant. Well, the dominant can be for ESFJs fairly quick. And the normalizing is definitely more slow paced and wanting to check off every box that, that is supposed to be checked off. I do think also what you'll see is regardless of what they're doing, and this is true for all of the normalizing, like, why are they not so ambitious at work? Well, because they have other priorities like their family and their community. And, and community, by the way, for some other completely different type, let's say INTP, 
could mean like a professional community, like doing open source projects. You know, that that's the INTP will consider that a very valid thing and that's adjacent to their work, but it's not the same. And, and it's the same for ESFJ, that they're going to be the one that goes to like help the kids uh, have costumes for the school play and uh, bake cookies for the, the open house, be a member of the parent teacher association. And as part of this, they're not just mousy contributors. I, I think the, the phrase that I use is friendly enforcer. They're still enforcers. They're still police officers, but in a very friendly way, a Canadian way. Um, and, and, and I think if there's, there's any, like you're trying to sort of like put it like a metaphor, easy to understand thing for each one. So if we have Joe Biden for dominant and Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz for creative, then here it, for, for normalizing ESFJ is just like the standard issue Canadian uh, in terms of the, the sort of like uh, archetype. And the HR person in, in your organization. Yes. Yeah. And every, every HR person. Yes. We, we know that there's some person who is that friendly enforcer. And when you're with them, you're like, oh, I just can't be rude to them. Like that would just be so awful. And then they create this atmosphere is like an enormous buffer to make sure that criticism doesn't come in and that the system remains stable through this tremendous like social buffering. And, and everything is so nice. Like the moment you complain, you're like, oh, but I'm the one causing trouble then if I complain. And, and so what happens is, and because I, I have encountered this person uh, in, in organizations, like exactly this, is content foments behind their back. And the, the discontent is not necessarily at them personally, because people will feel, oh, this is a very nice person. Um, maybe very stodgy and like too much follows the rules without really thinking about why the rules are there or when it's appropriate to bend them. Um, whereas ESFP, by the way, I always know when I'm encountering some kind of bureaucracy and I have some kind of choice about who I'm going to talk to, like going when, when I was at UCLA year after year, for some reason, we still had to get our own parking permits. So I'd have to go down to the, to the parking permit. Uh, building like every all the students and the faculty and staff and get it. And um, and you get in a kiosk line and I would always look for who I thought would be like the SP in, in the kiosk window because I'm like, oh, that's going to be so much easier. If there are any problems, the SP is just going to be like, oh, don't worry about it. Like, we'll just take care of it. You and, with this normalizing ESFJ, there, there is a sense of like family and camaraderie and stuff. And yet at the same time, they're just going to be like, at the end of the day, like, no, we have to follow the rules though. And, and I think that that can in some ways be very helpful for an organization but when, when it's really done in like a mature way. But when it's not, it's just about sort of mindlessly following policies in the name of fairness and not really paying attention to consequences because consequences is more of like an extroverted thinking kind of thing. Like, is it actually working for real? And then they wonder why there's discontent behind their back because things start to malfunction. Um, and, and yet there's no way to like express it. I, and I, I think some people can express it. So the types with extroverted intuiting, like the NP types, can use their sort of little side helpings of dark humor to like gently suggest to the ESFJ, oh, you're right. I guess they meant that by that joke. Boy, I should think about that. But NJ types in particular don't know how to be diplomatic with this kind of ESFJ. And then that just creates like a bunch of, um, you know, boats in, in the marina that have like, like hit up against each other. And as for some, some, for some like fun things, I think this is where we get the ESFJs who love craft work and music and nature, appreciation of animals, a cozy home like pets, um, but also just observing nature, not necessarily going camping. Like, let's be clear about that. But if they can go and stay in a very nice cabin or like a resort hotel and from your window, you see the deer down there eating and then you can go and throw them some bread. I mean, that's, you know, that's great. That's interactivity without like getting, you know, barbaric, having the beautiful cozy home. Um, having dinner parties, 
though those kinds of like wanting like a fun but also calm and beautiful life just know that that person is also going to have their speaking of wizard of oz witchy side to them because nobody can be nice all the time and they're going to get frustrated and feel at times like they're being stepped on and they're being used and i've put in like so many extra hours their week this week and not getting appreciation for it um that all of a sudden that you know witchy or warlock side can come out and people are like whoa what what happened with that um and I, I've seen that as well. And it's uh, it's actually amusing if you know type. You're like, oh, okay. Like they just have a sudden outburst. And and it's actually, it's an F-E-N-E kind of thing where where it's just like a persona that's coming out and, and is like shaking up the moment um, and not to, to take it too seriously. Um, and that's, uh, yeah. So that, that's a, a, quite a bit about the normalizing version. I, I would say... You know, and I try to think sometimes it's like, what is the, the best skill that goes along with each subtype? And I know I haven't really mentioned that before, but I would say for normalizing, it's logistical stuff. And that's true regardless of their temperament or whatever. Just being able to deal with the like day in and day out connecting of things. Um, and you would think then that that would make like the dominant subtype good at strategy, for example. Um, and they try and think at a strategic level, but ENF ESFJ is not ENTJ. They're just not. And so the movement for, for all ESFJs, I think to keep in mind, is getting things done with people and, and through people, ideally with people. Um, but if they're really not cooperative, then you sort of have to move through that. Um, and they're not necessarily, they're the type, I mean, SFJ is this idea, like this trust that, that an, an, an NT will have, that if we implement the strategy, then we're likely to have this kind of outcome. And we can then have like a backup plan for this other kind of outcome. And they don't trust that you can have strategies and foresee the future. Like they, they may nod, but at the end of the day, they're like, well, we just have to pick the right people and have strong relationships, and that's what will get things done. And, and I think that's an important way if, if there's ever, especially not, not for normalizing ESFJ, but for the other three ESFJs, are they some other type or, or are they an SJ? Um, it, it really is that, that there is this, you know, look at it. Is, do they actually trust thinking about the future? They, do they believe other people can foresee the future? To them, the, what, what like INFJ does, they understand INFJ's extroverted feeling, but the introverted intuiting to them is like bad or impossible. Like it will only trick you to have like to, to think that you can think ahead and like create a vision of yourself for the future. I mean, they see it as it has to be interpersonal and, and done as a group together or how, how can you just like, that sounds like magic to them and not in a fun Dorothy Wizard of Oz kind of way. It sounds sinister and witchy. And, and that's, I, I don't know how I got on that tangent, but it's something that I, I think helps differentiate this type from some of the like intuiting types or, or SPs. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's interesting how normalizing subtypes are better at logistics in general because they are trained to know the grind to to pay more attention to the details like even an intj who is normalizing may be better at details than a typical intj is in comparison yeah yeah so definitely get a normalizing person if you want to plan your vacations or plan uh, yeah. anything <laughs> all right cool and so i am curious about the harmonizing esfj Dario calls this the attentive facilitator. And so this ESFJ leans more heavily on oxytocin and estrogen, and they have more of a multi-diamond shape pattern in their brain or even zigzags, given that Dario talks a lot about how FE types are more likely to have the zigzag pattern mm -hmm. uh, in the form of harmonizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
this is uh, the kind of ESFJ or the facet of ESFJ that looks more like an NF, like um, ENFJ or, um, yeah, I would say that's probably the closest. And, and they might even identify with being more of an introvert at the beginning um, because there is a little bit more like retiring reflective quality to them and a lot more working of one-on-one. -on -one. And working one on one with people is, I feel like, the natural strength of, of uh, NFs, even if they don't actually do that in their job or or whatever it is. Um, so they're bringing, and I would say the the other thing that stands out for them is this sophistication um, that's very different from, say, the normalizing ESFJ. So if you meet two ESFJs and one is normalizing and or even dominant, and one of them is harmonizing. You're like, wow, can these even be the same type? Um, because one of them seems so much more sophisticated in their thinking than the other one is. The normalizing ESFJ does actually have like this thinking side to them, but it's focused on the level of details and logistics, whereas actually, which is where they put their thinking efforts. Um, whereas here, it's more like in a one on one, like person face-to-face -face kind of interactions. And that is where they're, they're putting their emphasis um, in, in terms of sophistication. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of those exact connections and, and all of the FJs too. And some even for types who have like, like ESTP and ENTP who have extroverted feeling third. Because it's sort of like you're you're making friends with regions that are that are on different hemispheres of the brain or you know one is back and one is in the front. And in addition to being like left versus right hemisphere and bringing those together. And, and it's, um, and this is backed up by the larger brain imaging research, not just in EEG, but in fMRI, not with respect to type per se, but because we know that the thinking feeling dimension and type does have a strong bias with respect to gender, like a two to one ratio, uh, male to female. So more males tend to identify as thinking types, more females tend to identify as feeling types that could be cultural or social, um, although it seems fairly robust across um, societies around the world. And, and just this, this, this zigzag, uh, like cross hemisphere pattern is more common among women than it is among men. So it's just, it's one of those things. It's not a determiner, it's just statistical, um, but it's a thing that, that's there. Um, and, and I believe it goes, it's not really about like gender per se of the person. It's more about their subtype actually, and the way that they think about things. Um, so there, there are these like connections that are about connecting things in interesting and sophisticated ways. Um, more than other ESFJs, they have good listening skills. Of course, they're still attending to factual practicalities. Um, uh, there, there is this, usually in their role, they have to do more listening than speaking, the opposite of the dominant. Um, and and I, I would say where they vary also with other ESFJs is they're not as good at sticking to plans or making decisions. That's a little bit more challenging because both of their functions, sensing and, and feeling, have this yin quality to them um, that's a little bit more like accepting and let's see what happens. I mean, they, they, they're not even as socially well-adjusted as the, the other three. So they can come off as being quirky and like oddballs a little bit compared to other ESFJs, which is then very easily why they're going to think like, oh, well, I must be an intuiting type. And, you know, when, when we look at the whole pattern, we're like, no, well, you're sensing preference, but there is this like cognitive quirkiness that's there. I, I would say that they engage a lot. Of course, when you're doing one-on-one -on -one with people, you're going to be, you could be an aide in, in a business, like giving advice or being a liaison between people in a department, um, being a counselor, diplomat, uh, executive coach. I say executive coach. Uh, they also could be sports coach, like whatever it is that is still like needing this one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction and a certain sophisticated way of thinking. Uh, within their discipline, um, project manager, psychologist, social scientist. Uh, there was a number of years ago, someone before me, oh, and I have, at the end of one of my books, I, I do reference her a couple of times. I haven't thought about her in a long time, though. 
So she was actually the first person in the type community to do EEG research and personality type. And I believe that was in the late 80s. Uh, and unfortunately, she passed away early uh, from cancer. And um, not a lot came of it. But she did begin to notice some patterns and observations that fortunately I got to read about because she did talk a little bit in conference proceedings and so on. Um, and her type preferences were ESFJ. And some people think like, oh, well, it's only the INT types who are like the super innovative in technology and like coming up with new things. And I mean, yeah, there's a kernel of truth to that, but actually any type. So here's somebody, ESFJ, in the type community for a long time and sort of thinking like, let's leverage the power of the, the university that I'm with and let's do a special project. So her inner ENTP, INTP is coming out and saying like, let's, let's just try this and see what we get. That's what I mean in part by the sophistication is that the the opposite type can come out in a way that is particularly interesting. Um, and I also found that they tend to be more like with ESTJs, more likely to be multicultural or to have like some kind of international background or outlook to them, which I think shakes up their introverted sensing, which isn't just so grounded in one culture, but has like multiple reference points. And, and when they have those multiple reference points and they're like, oh, OK, um, people are different. Same could be just like different social classes uh, or, you know, like maybe they, they come from their families come from two different ethnic groups are completely different. And then they grow up with that and see like, oh, how these are different from each other. Um, and I would say that more than the other ESFJs, they enjoy this element of novelty in in day to day life, like you know, be, being able to sort of like go, go on, go on journeys in, in the same way that there are some extrovert intuiting types who just love reading fantasy, fiction, romance, like that kind of thing. Here, this kind of ESFJ I probably really enjoys fantasy romance, for example, not just regular romance novels, but an element of fantasy romance. And that has that little bit of extra, um, I don't even know how to say it, but uh, like novelty to it. Novels have novelty. I know that's not very original, but um, ju just thinking of the one or two that I know, like more personally and what their interests are and sort of why that is that way, besides just looking at the numbers and the, the people out there. There is a certain type of innovation that comes from connecting one part of your brain to the other side of your brain, too. And so okay. harmonizing and creative have a natural innovativeness to them as well. Yeah. And and sometimes I find like ESFJs can show their empathic and reflective side by reflecting on the details of the people around them. So like an ESFJ might remember your name very well or also like certain things about you to make you feel so special that they actually care enough to archive that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very important extra point that between ESFJ and ESTJ, ESFJ is far more likely to remember your important personal details that make you or, or needs that make you a little bit different than everybody else. So especially in not maybe the last 10 or 20 years, but certainly before the year 2000 and, and definitely before the 1990s, things like gluten-free, lactose intolerant, and people were like vaguely aware of those, some people. Um, the chance that a friend or relative, especially a relative, would remember like, oh, you need gluten-free things. ESTJ would be far more likely to dismiss that kind of thing or just like simply actually maybe care about the person but not remember um, because it doesn't fit the template. Whereas SFs, like all of the sensing feeling types, but this, you know, ESFJ in particular is going to remember, and not just about the food preferences, but all the little pet peeves through your life. Like, oh, remembering like, oh, Sally doesn't like dogs because of this unfortunate encounter she had when she was four. And, you know, Sally is like a niece or something like that. You don't even see her that often. But remembering those kinds of things. And, and then the small little behavior things, like remember to not say this word in front of this person, because this word is going to remind them of this situation in the past that was not pleasant. Like, I don't know, an ex-husband or something like that. Um, and, and many other types either feel like, oh, that's something to get over. Like, oh, maybe just not that important. 
um, and like not appreciating the way that the ESFJ does that that these are not not all ESFJs are like this. I mean, the dominant, the least so, but the the harmonizing is going to be the most so to remember all of these small sort of like pet peeves and like little little mini triggers for people and to like actually work around those. Yeah. And so I'm curious, Stereo, what are some themes that all ESFJs share regardless of their subtype? They're often drawn to managing people, not for the management part of that, but to really just like help others, um, help society. I think in, in the rubric, if we think about in any environment, you have you have the individual as a unique person and you have task, like the tasks that you need to do. You have the team or group. And then you have like the overarching culture. And I feel like that they're very aware ESFJ of the group or team within the context of the culture. So it's like we as a team and our group, like why are we doing this in order to better society? Very, very different from even ESFP, which is here is me as a performer, as a star doing my task, which is singing and dancing. And, and it's like almost at opposite ends of the spectrum there. So I would say it's not managing. It's like managing with people toward some kind of common betterment for, for society. Um, I, I think that like all FJs, there is this, you know, what is it that others need? Like listening to them, allowing people to voice their concerns, accommodating their needs. Um, and then this is very like a lot for ESFJ. Like this is very much something that they do, especially in the practical realm. Um, making sure you have somewhere comfortable to sleep, that your socks don't have holes in them. This is a big deal, by the way. Uh, I have discovered that intuiting parents don't necessarily think it's a big deal that their kids have, or that they even have some socks that have holes in them. Like for, for people who have a sensing preference, I mean, you know, maybe not ISTP, but but for ESFJ, they can be like, oh, my God, I'm not going to let my child go to school with with holes in their socks like that. That's just like failure as a parent. And but like and it's not just like that one detail is suddenly so important is that there are thousands of details like that. And let's make sure all of those details are taken care of, that their food is like nutritious and not spoiled, um, that they're going to be wear something that's fashionable enough so that the other children don't make fun of them that they have a haircut that improves their appearance rather than making you know, them look like they want to be ostracized. Um, so it's like really taking care of and like being mindful of all of those small things and providing what's needed. That doesn't mean that they always understand what other people need. And this is a growing area, especially for ESFJ, but for ENFJ sometimes too. Um, what what they think is valuable and needed in general for people maybe doesn't apply to that person. You know, the the INFP who wants to read books and has a rich fantasy life and wants to write poetry, the INTP who is very happy to, a uh, child, I'm talking about in both cases, who's interested in like experiments and, and not hygiene um, or playing outside or whatever it is. And... And the ESFJ father or mother or guardian is going to be like, no, but my child needs this and the child needs that. And, and how much of that is really true? And how much of them is projecting their own FE needs and what they perceive as what society needs? I, I mean, I think a great example, although this came from my mom as an ENFJ, but I think it applies to ESFJ more so even is like when I went for an interview at UCLA for teaching and my mom was like, well, you, you need to, I had a ponytail then. I mean, it was the nineties. Um, and she said, you know, you need to get a haircut so that you're presentable. And I'm like, no, I, I don't think so. Like, I'm just going as me. Um, like I'm going to be like reasonably dressed and everything, but, but I'm keeping who I am. And it turns out in the end, I was hired because I had a ponytail like that specifically stood out to them. It's something the kids can relate to. Um, and this is an example where I think especially dominant Effie can make a mistake that even heroes can make mistakes. And, and in this case, it's like maybe being in tune with the society and cultural norms, but in the wrong decade.
And so it's a need then for ESFJ, even definitely more than ENFJ, to be like aware of like, oh, what decade is this? Um, and like keeping up with that. Um, I think that they really do strive to keep things pleasant and to keep like a sense of continuity um, for like human comfort. Uh, sometimes it means that the cost of doing things that are unpleasant but needed for the future. Um, and, and I think the surprising side of them is that they can actually be fairly, I, I want to say like much more, like whatever it is is their interest area, much more critically adept, like much more skilled and knowledgeable than people might imagine. And it really then can come to people as a surprise. They think like, oh, well, this person is just like, oh, they're making sure I'm comfortable during my, uh, let's say, like um, job interview. And, and, you know, do I want some coffee or tea and that kind of thing? And then the interviewee is sort of surprised to learn that the person interviewing them isn't just your straight up HR person, but actually served as an engineer for many years and is also ESFJ but has like all of this engineering knowledge to go with it. That engineering knowledge doesn't excite them in the same way. They do see value in it, um, but they can really then be a surprise. And I think also for ESFJ, of all of the SJs, they're the ones most likely to um, find themselves in a little bit of trouble. And that's um, stirring the pot a little bit too much. Um, Wanting, wanting to sort of get a rise out of people, I, I think very much like there, there is like the classic soap opera, where there's just like the soap opera never ends, does it? Soap opera. There's ones, I, I don't, I, I don't remember what they are now, but like as the world turns and the the bold and the beautiful and that kind of thing, like they go on for decades, and and they do capture this like there's twists and there's turns and you have to tune in next week. And like, what happened? And did she really say that? And did he really do that? And, and what's going on? And, and there is this, like this, this, because of the little bit of the extroverted intuiting, this like playful, um, like a bringing this playfulness to life and into their lives. And then I think where they can be let down on is with respect to their opposite type or near opposite that, you know, NTPs, especially ENTPs can come up with a lot of like cool ideas that could be implemented as a business. And ESFJ also comes with cool ideas that could be a business. Cool, they aren't the same cool ideas, they're different ideas. It could be a craft business or whatever, a restaurant, running a restaurant. How many ESFJs have imagined, oh, my dream job would be to running a restaurant. Oh my God, do you know how difficult running a restaurant is? Is like, not that they can't do it, but like, they're going to find themselves let down at a certain point um, that even their small Etsy store, which got too big too quickly and actually was too much of a success, um, all of a sudden is like much more than a little side entrepreneurial project and like carries with it all these responsibilities and ramifications and, you know, people trying to steal your business and bankruptcy and like negative reviews and all of these things. And then they're like, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? Um, and all they meant was to do something a little bit fun on the side. Yeah, that extroverted intuiting can get away from themselves and be like, oh, that's possibility I pursued. Why did I pursue this possibility? Makes sense. Yeah. It, it's yeah. like a 10-year-old trying to run an entrepreneurial project. <laughs> and then the SI who's like, I have to maintain all of this, then realizes the repercussions of the commitments that you've made. So. Yes, yes. I, I do remember one talking about starting a pie making business because she loved pies. And that she's like, I now after like a couple of years, I never want to see or eat like another pie again in my life. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah. Because there, there is all this logistics involved, which they can do. But then yes, the SI feels this big responsibility. And the FE is like, I don't want to let people down. And, and, and they're not very good at strategy or contingency plans or automating things. Mm -hmm. um, and when they do engage in automating, just the process of getting it automated is so much work for them. Mm -hmm. that they be completely eclipsing what they like, take more time and effort than the automation itself. It's like, mm -hmm. let's get QuickBooks and enter everything that we do, even though the business only has one person. 
<laughs> and, and it might make sense for the business, but I have to say as a TJ type, you go with the thing that's most efficient, not the thing that is lauded as like the expert tool. Too many expert tools actually are for advanced users and for things that are bigger than what people are doing. Mm. And, and there's all these little like, you know, a 10% doing, doing say ENTP 10%, is not going to be very successful ENTP. So that's the same. And it's the same for any type, by the way, out there listening. Um, when you do stuff that's your opposite type, like really and truly keep it to a hobby so it stays within that 10% or like just know you're getting yourself into trouble um, <laughs> because then you're going to need to go from 10% to like 80%. And, mm -hmm. and it's your opposite type. And it's it's one thing for me to enjoy like singing and playing guitar and doing that at some events and whatever it is, especially in a foreign language, but to be a musician, I mean, there are, I, I do know there are INTJ musicians, but that's like a huge, huge thing to like try and jump over and like incorporate all these elements of my opposite type. And I don't just mean quiet musician by myself in a recording studio. I mean, like you're performing with others live extemporaneously, like ESFP land. Mm. And I, it would just warn anybody, but probably... <laughs> ESFJ needs the most warning because they're the least likely to think that far ahead. You know, the introverted intuiting is their like trickster function. Um, like just keep it to a hobby, like keep it to a hobby. Um, no matter how much the, the, you know, you feel like you want to jump in and make it bigger. Wise words. I guess the last thing that's coming to mind is I think about the relationship with how people see extroverted feeling and how different it can be. Some people call extroverted feeling the nice guy function. And then some people associate it with like the mean girl syndrome from like, um, like the, the mean girl from the mean girls movie, like people mm -hmm. think she's an ESFJ. And so I'm like, Oh, the, I guess like it's the polar opposites of, of a type within a type itself. That FE yeah. isn't just nice, nice. Like you can have the really nice ESFJs that are very wholesome and great host and shepherd for, for things and communities and for others. And then you have the ESFJs that use their FE to gossip and to, to talk about social norms about other people. So yeah. and how they're either following them or not following them and mm -hmm. their judgments around that. So Oh, absolutely. I, I really <laughs> feel even more than ESFJ, ISFJ gets talked about in this very nicey nice way and and that just isn't necessarily the case and social class social status um what i call the social emotions um all the things that are triggered because of social interactions like envy jealousy resentment that that those are all like part of the palette of the function and that the function can be very much like this sort of strong yang shepherd personality um, or it can be a much softer, more accommodating host personality. And, and that's just around the dominant function, not to mention the others. Um, and, and so, yeah, there definitely is much more. I mean, I hope if anything, and, and of course, we have to give credit to Viktor Galenko because he was the one in Ukraine, like really spelling these subtypes out for the first time. And it was all based on his observations as, as, a, as a psychologist. Uh, and, and type user, socionics user, um, but it's sort of like recognizing the huge diversity that's there. And this is just an area where, you know, the SJ types in particular get conveyed in a very two-dimensional way. Mm. And, and I think if we want to make them three-dimensional, a great way to start is including the third function. And then beyond that, like really accounting for the subtype of the person and remembering that a dominant ESFJ I, you know, I, I don't have like a, an archetypal person for, for the, the harmonizing ESFJ. Um, should probably come up with one, um, that would fit pretty well. I mean, of course there are people I know in the database, but is like a classic cultural norm, but we, we at least have three out of the four. I'll think of the other one. And if I remember it, I'll put it in the comment section when you, when you post this. Yeah. Sounds good. And so thank you, Dario, for coming out today. Feel free to check out his book. It goes into the 64 subtypes and you can read all about them too. And so thank you, Dario, for your contribution to the type space. And we'll see you all in the next video. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.